What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., Claudia Bellafato holding it down at the DraftKings studio in Boston. We got a great show for everybody today. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out here live Monday through Friday, 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. Tell a friend. We're on DraftKings Network wherever you get that. You can get the best of Gojo and Golik. VSIN Radio, wherever you hear that, from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern for that hour every day. Claudia, what do we got coming up on the show today for everybody? Ahead on this Tuesday edition, we have Auerbach Etology. The Athletics' Nicole Auerbach joins us to break down the bracket. <laughs> Comfy for Caleb. Is Chicago changing their identity for Caleb Williams? And Tuesdays now are wild. Charlotte Wilder in hour two covering the hook shot heard around the world. What the latest NFL moves mean for the draft and more. But first... It is starch madness, baby. Gojo, I'm going to give you the honors of breaking down the full bracket reveal. Yes, we are very excited to finally unveil this project to everybody today. We will get into the entrails of actual March Madness, all of the stuff that Claudia just mentioned. But yesterday we debuted the beginning, the first bite, if you will, into starch madness with our Fry 4, the best fries in all of fast food, as now we look to crown a champion, a full 32-team field of some of the best fast food menu items this great nation has to offer, nay, this world has to offer. And what we are going to do is we are going to pit them against each other to try and find the best. We have queued up four regions for you guys in our giant bracket. We have got the four, uh, the sides region, desserts region, drinks, and mains here. And we're going to have you, the fans, vote each and every day on a couple of these menu items going up against one another to try and help crown a champion here in our first annual Starch Madness bracket. So every day at Gojo and, Go- at Gojo and Golik on Twitter is where you're going to be able to find the voting, much like we did with the Fry Four yesterday. But here it's just going to be 1v1 on these votes. They are going to be a single elimination tournament just like March Madness, so follow our show handle, check it out there, and make sure that you help us do this uh, thing the right way. We have the winner from yesterday's Fry 4, by the way. Congratulations to the veteran, the blue chipper, McDonald's Fries. Uh, An overwhelming victory for them, by the way. Second place, Five Guys Burgers and Fries, much to the dismay of some of the people in our comments. Arby's in third and checkers and rallies. I was really stunned, Dad, given the groundswell of public support. When I tweeted about this a while back, let me tell you what, there were a lot yeah. of people raising their hands for yeah. checkers and rallies. And as someone who sampled them, incredible girth on those fries, usually very well cooked through. You don't have to worry about them being soggy. But unfortunately, I just don't think has the overall national brand appeal. Yeah. And that seems to be what won out here with McDonald's. Well, that's what's going to happen, I think, in some of these. It's the regionalization of some of these fast food meals and some of some from some of the fast food places that we're going to talk about. But what I love always is the strong reaction to a things not on the list or b things that aren't winning on the list. That's what I love. I I've loved doing sports radio for decades, and always the topics that are outside the world of sports garner the most interest. It's always been one of the most amazing things to me. You could have the greatest stories, sports stories in the world. But as I said, one time Greeny and I talk about Batman and Robin. It takes over the show. And God forbid you talk about fast food, Claudia, because that is going to absolutely take over the airwaves. Well, breaking news to me right now is the fact that Subway Cookie is even on the dessert call. Wait, who, who thought of that? A Subway Cookie? Come on. You so can't even I'm put glad that. I get it, the 17, but come on, guys. Really? Listen, Claudia, I'm glad you mentioned this. This is a, this yep. whole list was put together because to Dad's point, and I firmly believe this, you get what you give. We have been fat on air for a long time, which means we have attracted a tribe of like-minded people who appreciate everything the fast food world has to offer them. And so I did a lot of this via the crowdsourcing on Twitter. Unbeknownst to our audience, I had been chumming the waters trying to get some information. And when I asked about fast food desserts and I pulled the masses and the people that are on my timeline, there were plenty of people that pointed out the Subway cookie as a tried and true member. Because, Claudia, you got to think, there's a lot of good items out there, but we're also talking 
talking a little bit about nostalgia that's involved in this. We're talking about things right. that have access to the most people. There's some regional representation on this list, but a lot of it is big national chains because that's available to everyone there. It's ubiquitous, ubiquitous across the country, and so... That's how we wound up with the Subway Cookie, which, by the way, I had the foot-long version not too long ago. Hubba Hubba, that thing, an absolute <laughs> yeah. joy. I had it in Vegas. It was hot and fresh. There was a ton of it, great volume, all of that stuff. So, uh, and, and you know what? We are here to embrace debate on all these fronts, to Claudia's right. point here. We don't want to go unchallenged and unchecked. So, again, at Gojo and Golik on Twitter, you can get a look at the entire bracket coming out right now. Our regions, again, are beverages, desserts, mains, and sides. The voting for the first matchup in the main region is actually open right now, so you can head over to at Gojo and Golik to cast your votes there. And we're going to do a couple of the matchups here for you right now. We'll get into a couple more with Charlotte here, but Dad, we have got today going out two of the votes. McDonald's double quarter pounder, the one seed, which we did this via committee, so this is not all of my... I did not have right. McDonald's as the one seed here, but I understand, given what we talked about with the fries and given their history in this nation, the double quarter pounder with cheese, which is better than the Big Mac, obviously, is the one seed here going up against the eight seed Burger King Whopper. And, Dad, you've always had more kind things to say about the Whopper than I have. I really don't think yeah. it's that good of a fast food burger. It's an, an understandable eight seed here, and I think they're going to get walloped. Listen, we talk about the nostalgia of, of McDonald's. Burger King is right there as well. I mean, it's such a known establishment. This is my childhood, right? I was a swimmer growing up, and we rode oh. our bikes to our swim practice all the time. And this is where we would go. We would go to McDonald's, or we would go to Burger King, right? Right there in Willowick, where I grew up. They were almost right next to one another. And we would just trade off. Now, I would eat McDonald's a little more than Burger King, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of both of these. I'm a big fan of the Whopper. I know you're not. I still get the Whopper. I still eat the Whopper. I still like the Whopper. But I, I am Whoppers. lean more I've toward... I have never seen you go get a Whopper as an adult man. Not a single time I have not heard of it here. You've abandoned the Whopper. Don't lie to people. Do you... Re you know, you know, we don't live in the same state. Do you understand that? That we don't see each other that much during the year, okay? And I'm you don't go out with me an awful lot. You go ahead and text mom. Go ahead and text her. Text her right now. <laughs> and she'll probably be on her when son's side and Dad against her husband. See, I, I, I have gotten the quarter pound of a cheese more than I've gotten the Whopper, but I still appreciate the Whopper. I still appreciate it. That being said... My vote will go for the uh, double quarter pounder with cheese. It is, it is, it's a staple for me. I absolutely dig it. Not, it's not my favorite fast food as this will continue on, but in this matchup, it will, it will be the double quarter pounder with cheese, by the way, with cheese. For, 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 for the sake of accuracy, my mom did say dad does go to the Burger King. I forgot when you guys live in South Bend for that half of the year, there is a Burger King in very close proximity to the grocery store out there. She said he doesn't go regularly, but he does love the Whopper. So my dad's credentials <laughs> are confirmed by his adult supervisor, my mom. Thank you. Uh, if we Thank were you. setting odds here, I didn't hear I, and I'm sorry. I, I think that... The double pounder is like unfair because I feel like the, it's such a heavy favorite. That feels like UConn to me right now because is anybody really going to bet on Arby's beef and cheddar or the Baconator? I feel like it's really the Whopper and pounder that everybody knows oh. to be true. Like, and I get yeah, it I that don't Burger know. King's an eight seed, but still to me, maybe I don't eat enough fast food. But the rest of these, yeah, like, is Popeye's chicken sandwich, does it slap that hard that it should be two? Uh, oh, Claudia, I fully agree with this one here. That's the other matchup. The 2-7 is the Popeye's chicken sandwich and the Arby's beef and cheddar. The chicken sandwich debate on its own because I believe we've got the Chick-fil-A <laughs> chicken sandwich in here as well. Going to be contentious. I, I do think the Popeye's chicken sandwich slaps that hard. That was a sensation that yes. had people driving to go get this thing. Mash massive portions, well-breaded, good bun to actual meat ratio. You get the pickle mixed in there also. But I am so, I have such a soft spot for Arby's dad. Seeing them as a seven seed pain me. I think the beef and cheddar <laughs> is a staple of this great American institution. I was devastated that curly fries lost in the fry four. And so I need to see something good happen in the, they'll have the dessert region covered. Wendy's is the, uh, for the Frosty's the one seed in the dessert region, deservedly so. But I'm worried about the beef and cheddar's odds here to start this off. So we were, again, in that same string in Willowick where McDonald's and Burger King is. There is an Arby's as well. 
And one of the last times we were there, your sister Sydney and Ben uh, was there as well. Ben is a freak on Arby's roast beef sandwiches. So we went there. One of the things I loved as a kid at Arby's is you know how you get the packets now of the horsey sauce and, and barbecue sauce and all that? Yeah. They had the actual containers. You could squirt as much as you wanted on there. I mean, it was it was bedlam. It was fantastic of how much you could you could put on your sandwiches. So I I the 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 Arby's beef and cheddar is a little more nostalgic to me. I I I had it with Ben because he had it, so I had gotten it, but I hadn't eaten one in a while. Uh, I, I'm a and to your point, Claudia, I don't know the McDonald's double uh, quarter pounder. I I don't think is going to win this region overall. I think it's it's the number one, and I agree. But there's some other ones that really go hard in this one. So so again, it's McDonald's double quarter pounder versus a Burger King Whopper. That's the one eight, and then Popeye's chicken sandwich against the Arby's beef and cheddar, the two seven. So I I do like these. I have had these all the time. I'm. I, and, and your mother always yells at me because I call it Popeyes and not Popeyes. Uh, but n- you know, neither here nor there. Um, I, I know where I'm voting in this one, and I think this is a really, really good start to this. I, we do have an important. Uh, well, this is very important. We have another important bracket to talk about. But quickly, I feel like sauce has such a big impact on all of these because yeah. Chick Fil A sauce. I feel like makes the Chick Fil A sandwich better than a lot of McDonald's items. Maybe that's just me. But do you guys not agree that sauce has a big impact that we're not really taking into account here, or are you? Oh, we thought about doing a, a whole sauce like, totally. portion of the bracket totally. because yeah. it is that effective. <laughs> Ultimately decided against it, but you're absolutely mm. right. Between things like the famed McDonald's Szechuan sauce, the Taco Bell hot sauce packets, obviously Chick-fil-A sauce, like you mentioned, Arby's horsey sauce. You can keep on going. I'm going to keep on salivating, but <laughs> this is uh, exactly what we hoped it would be. It's beautiful to see it all come together. So again, everybody get out and vote. Be a part of your process here. Go and make sure the favorite fast food restaurant of your childhood gets the love that it deserves in this bracket we'll touch on a little bit more of this with charlotte when she joins us in hour number two but claudia we do have another bracket for the people that want to just stick to stick to sports and get to the march madness bracket of it all we have a show bracket now tell them how they can get to it claudia so it's called beat the golix bracket contest it's basically for listeners to enter into a real bracket compete (laughs) against the golix try and beat them this is live on DraftKings right now so if you head over to DraftKings network on twitter you can find Find out how to enter. Basically, you get a $2,000 bonus bet if you win, just like any other bracket contest. The most points at the end of the tournament wins it all. So go to DKN on Twitter, find the link to enter, repost it, fill out your bracket, and we'll be following along with the contest on the show, of course, throughout the tournament for updates and a little trash talk amongst the guys. Now, Senior, I know you said you have several brackets that you do throughout the tournament, or I should say before the tournament. How many have you yeah. filled out yet? Go, Joe. What's the deal with you, but see well, you first. <laughs> Well, th- this one you can only do one. So, and, and this is like a lot, a lot of other tournaments I go in. Where I get multiples is I go in a lot of different contests. I don't not now if there is a contest where you can do multiple sheets, I'll do it. But this one, understand you can do one sheet. So I have to pick my one sheet of integrity. But I will do multiples, uh, Mike, as you well know, for other contests out there as well. Because I'm about winning the contest. I'm not about integrity. I'm, I'm not, as I said, I'm not calling the upsets. Uh, I won't. I won't raise my hand and say I saw that one coming when I have it on sheet eight instead of sheet four. Uh, I'm just about winning these pools. But for this one, I have to get one main sheet ready to go uh, to be involved in this, so I can win. Yeah, I, I listen, I'm a little bit more familiar with the one sheet lifestyle, mostly out of sheer laziness, like your ability to go through and fill out all those brackets, even in a day and age where it's done digitally. But I'm sure with you, you're printing them out and doing these analog, right? You only know one speed. It's printed out the paper bracket and then just find a way to get somebody like my. Yeah, there it is. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it, it's unbelievable. No that's one great. no one in the year 2024 that's not an active office, like an entire office full of people, kills more trees than my father on his own. He is single-handedly waging war against the environment each and every day because every part of our rundown, everything in his life has to be printed out so he can hold it in his hands and see it with his own two eyes. I love it because when the aliens take <laughs> over and cut all technology, your dad will be thriving with all of his brackets. So Boom. respect to you, Steve. There you go. All of a sudden. 
sudden, people are going to be coming to me for information. They're going to say, wait, I had this on my computer. The aliens have wiped it out. Golik, what do you got? And I'll say, well, you know what's going to cost you a pretty penny to get some info from me. That's what's going to happen, Mike. So just understand that. Dad, how do you pick your upsets? Do you go by vibes here? A lot of people pick by teams. I've seen people pick by mascot before. Do you have any tried and true method? Do you change well, it up amongst all the brackets? How do you do this? Well, I mean, listen, I, I do some research. I don't I don't pick my my bracket right away. You know, in I start to look at some of the trends, how teams are playing toward the end of the season. Uh, and then I know that, you know, there's usually a 12-5 or, or now the 11 has been like the 12 now. The 11 gets the win uh, normally. And it's, uh, then I always like to decide which, who's going to be the first number one seed to get knocked out. Because the, while the women's side usually holds chalk a little better than the men's side, when you only have one sheet to pick out, it's tough to go away from chalk because you, sometimes you don't want to take that chance. Um, but but I'll look at how teams are playing. I'll look at I will look at backcourts because man, we hear this, Mike. We've been doing this for how many years? You hear a veteran backcourt is such a huge thing, you know, in this tournament. So you you got to look and you got to do a little bit of homework. Now that doesn't mean you're going to win this thing. I mean, this is one of those where anybody can you know throw darts and get a win because you just th th that's why Thursday and Friday, Saturday and Sunday are just so much fun to watch these upsets early on. Yeah, the last, I believe, two years, we've had what would, I think it's qualifies as separated by five or more uh, seating slots. We've had 14 upsets a year in the last couple of years. Usually the average is around eight and a half per year, but the last couple of years have been particularly chaotic for a number of reasons. And so I love it because it means that I have to use less brain power because this is already going to go sideways in a hurry. So I'm just looking around trying to like I have talked myself into already Sanford's beaten Kentucky. Not a doubt in my mind. Awesome offense for Kentucky. Lackluster defense. Sanford chucks up threes like it's their job. Oh, no. Sanford's the press team. I'm sorry. McNeese is the one that chucks up threes. Sanford, they're going to press you all the time here. Bucky McMillan, their coach, has lived in Birmingham his entire life. The guy was a high school basketball coach around there, and now he's got these guys out here just absolutely trying to run people ragged, and wouldn't it be the fun? Always, when in doubt, defaulting in sports, when the funniest possible thing could happen, usually they that's the way I lean because the sports world and the sports gods have a particularly sick sense well, of humor. So I've talked myself into multiple 12-5, 13-4 upsets already that are going to yeah, probably wind yeah. up in this one bracket because I can't help myself. Because the minute you give me a little window, Claudia, into something yep. that could be in a little advantage for the underdog or the small school guy, I'm like, all right, perfect. Let's rock with it. Yeah, you got to try and find those edges. But the issue here is I told you I had a Kentucky ticket. Go, Joe. So what are you trying to do here? Wow. Wow. I mean, that's, you know, that's listen, really disrespectful. Betting, <laughs> fading, fading me probably been in good business for some people over the years, so maybe I'm helping you out by reverse mushing this. I am going to go here and clearly get this wrong, and so you can only not only look right, look very smart on this show because you are, but also maintain your winning ticket, so you're welcome. <laughs> That's what the, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I know a group of guys that are so high on Kentucky, and I just sort of got some money down just to have a little action in it. So I'm not really rooting hey. too hard for Kentucky, but we'll see what happens. A if they can piece it all Listen, together and defense shows up, they could get through. <clears throat> Action in the action in the game is uh, is one of the best things out there. Like I'm with you, Mike. I already said Grand Canyon. I think that you know sitting there are, is going to a 12 seed is going to beat St. Mary's a five and then Alabama a four. I I think they're going two rounds. You know, like I said, the 11 sixes have become you know pretty prominent as well. Bottom line, gang out there, you have a chance to vote on food in our Starch Madness, which is a lot of fun. It's always fun to vote on on fast food, so we do that, and you get a chance to win a two thousand dollar bonus bet. I mean, by doing a a regular actual sheet of basketball. I mean, how great is that? So get involved, get your voting in, get your sheets in, and let's have some fun. Yes, at DK Network on Twitter is where you can check out the bracket challenge that we have live on the sports book. Again, $2,000 in bonus bets up for grabs there. At Gojo and Golik is where you vote on Starch Madness. And coming up here next, we are also declining our bid to the NIT. Find out who we have that in common with coming up next.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik. The NIT tournament starts today, but without several teams that were invited, let's take a look at the six teams that decided to opt out of the 32-team tournament. St. John's at the top, Indiana, Oklahoma, Pittsburgh, Memphis, and Ole Miss. Now, of course, this is seen as sort of a secondary tournament to March Madness for those who fell short, whether it's disappointment of not making it or they just want to get a head start on recruiting. They decided to opt out, but this did not sit well with ESPN analyst and former College Hoops head coach Tom Crean. There's no question about it. I would want to coach. I would want to develop my team. Uh, you've got bigger staffs than you've ever had. There's plenty of time for the portal. There's plenty of time to talk to recruits. There's plenty of time to negotiate NIL deals. There's not plenty of time to play. There's not plenty of time to get your players on the floor and give them a chance to get better. There's not plenty of time for guys to continue to play that may never get to play again. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is absolutely ridiculous. It's each coach's choice. I get it. But if you take away a chance to play the games, to put your team on the floor, mm -hmm. let them opt out. All right, the bowl season has it all the time. Let it happen. Who cares? Give your players and coaches a chance to keep coaching and playing, wow. and don't shortchange. If a guy doesn't want to play, go sit down. If a coach doesn't want to coach, go recruit. But there's got to be enough people to put five, six, seven people on the floor and go play. Makes absolutely zero sense to me. Cream fired up. Wow. Senior. Wow. Senior, let's go to you first because wow. this sort of reminds me of like the Pro Bowls and the draft process in football. I understand why teams are opting out, but do you agree with Green that this is becoming an issue? Well, I mean, listen, I, I'm not at every single one of these schools and they all probably have different situations. You know, some are mad, like Rick Patino. I, I mean, he, he starts saying you should never mention certain you know ways they're going about ranking us again because we were ranked higher and didn't get in and he's ticked off. There is part of me that always thinks from a coach's side, coaches always want extra time to coach. And the NIT is extra time to coach, extra time to work with your players, especially players that are coming back. Players get the, you know, a lot of these guys are done, they're done playing basketball. They've been playing basketball since they were five years old and this is it. You know, and, and the whatever last game, whether they lost in, the, in their conference tournament, they could get maybe another game or a couple of more in the NIT. Everybody wants to kind of maybe prolong that if they can. So I, I, I can see Tom Crean getting, you know, kind of emotional about that, saying, you know, coaches, you know, have an ability to work with players. Players still can get a couple of more games in. I get all that. Um, I, I really do. And I would probably lean toward that as well. But, I mean, the NIT to me is, is such an afterthought of a tournament. We may not even have it anymore soon once they expand, but that, that's, a, that's another conversation. And I, I, never, I never follow the NIT. But that being said, I'm not in it, like, I, like, like Tom Crean said. You're not there. You're not playing your last games you'll ever play as a competitive basketball player. Coaches getting extra time with their players. Like football coaches in bowl games, you get an extra 15 practices that you could always use. So coaches can coach younger guys and play younger guys. To me, coaches, I always figured coaches wanted that extra time no matter where they got it. But in this case, you know, you got a handful of coaches and teams that's uh-uh, screw that, we're not playing in it. Yeah, and, and a lot of people have taken this time to point out that Tom Crean and the Indiana team that he was coaching famously also did not enter into the NIT, but I believe it was shown that that was the year Tom Crean ended up getting fired, and that was part of the reason why yeah. they decided to decline the bid that year, but their AD had come out with some things about not wanting to you know devalue the court there by doing all that, and listen, there is the perception this is lesser than. I saw our buddy Jordan Cornett tweeting about this yesterday, saying his lowest moment as a Notre Dame basketball player was playing in the NIT. Like, it's not something that's got all yeah. this prestige and kind of feels like, hey, Dad, when we talk about these lower tier bowl games in college football, right. we enjoy watching all of them. But for a player, it's not always fun to go down. Like, you're not super juiced to go down and play in a number what? of these games. But the biggest difference I think that shows up is you mentioned – for college football's bowl season, you get 15 extra practices. You cannot right. practice football, but during the season and then in those 15 spring ball practices. So when you get those 15 added practices, that's huge for you. It's on-field skill development in a way that you can't right. do because of how the sport's structured. In basketball, you can get runs. 
You got you can play five on five hoops all year long. You can play in pickup. You can play in all the side leads that go. There's still plenty of places to develop skill. And now that you've got the transfer portal opening up yesterday in college basketball, it creates a different dynamic. It's why you saw some of these firing situations trying to get their ducks in a row as the portal gets ready to open. Because for a lot of teams now, this is an important part of your team building and a time of year where yeah. you've got to make a decision of are we going to hang on to this season that clearly only went so well because we're playing in the NIT. Or, depending on our station in life, are we going to get started on the next step? We saw Rick Pitino blast his roster during the season and take a lot of heat for it. And yep. so I'm not stunned that now all of a sudden they want to get a jump start on, I'm sure, in his mind, making that better. I, I Listen, I can, I can easily see both sides of this. I'm not ripping any, any team for not wanting to go and making that decision. If that's their choice, that's fine. And you talk about how they can play five on five and do their own thing. I get that, but you know coaches, Mike. Coaches like to control. And if you're in the NIT, you get to control practices. You get actual practices that the head coach can be part of, not your guys playing off on their own. And in my senior year, we played in a meaningless bowl. We weren't going anywhere, but, but the bowl game was in Hawaii, so that was nice. But even if it wasn't, you know, it was one more game I wanted to play in a Notre Dame uniform. You know, no matter what bowl game it was going to be, it wasn't wasn't going to mean anything because we didn't have a great year. But it was one more chance, at least for me, before I moved on to put to put the uniform on and play. So that was me, and 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 it doesn't mean that everybody has to think that way. There may be players that are done, let alone coaches that are like, you know what, screw this, don't want to do it anymore. Let's just move on to the next phase. So this is one of those situations where I, I'm surprised. Because I know coaches love to control things so much and get extra work in so much that they wouldn't do this. But there is now the added portal opens up, which is a whole nother thing that they have to deal with right now uh, as well. Uh, but, but to me, it's always surprising when coaches choose not to have structured still structure around them from practices to games when they can get that extra. And because coaches are always looking for more time normally. Yeah, but I feel like you can create structure in other places. I mean, hell, we've always laughed at the notion of voluntary workouts in college sports. Like, you can make mm -hmm. something voluntary when it's done, make sure everybody's there and showing up, and there's going to be that implied pressure that, hey, you better be here and we better be doing our thing the way you do. Because I'm with you. Like, these are all control freaks, there's no doubt. But I think that's part right. of this is they're trying to figure out how to control for a total new era of basketball. We talked to Coach Ivy yesterday about this, and she said you get to practice and you're almost breathing a sigh of relief because of all the stuff other stuff that you have to juggle and that was before nil and the portal all got popped open the way that they did so i, I don't begrudge anyone that opportunity and again the nit is never something that's had a ton of prestige you want to talk about something no that between no. all of these changes going on now and the threat of expanding the ncaa tournament and i truly wonder how much longer something like the nit is going to be around if yes. you're constantly just fielding teams far below 500 who don't have any sort of brand cachet i don't know what the payout's like for them because I know the NCAA tournament sustains a lot of these one bid leagues and really helps lift a lot of people up financially. I don't know what the NIT's payout is like if that's enough to keep it going for people. I, I think what you just hit on a thing here where we're going now, right? That if the NIT wants to exist even after expansion, they better offer more of a payout, right? They better entice you to want to do it because you weren't good probably, according to you know Jay Williams, going to be an 80-team uh, uh, NCAA tournament. So how are you going to get teams? You know, So this year, again, in case people don't know, it was St. John's, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma, Memphis, Ole Miss, Indiana, who declined the NIT. So how are you going to get teams to go to the NIT? We're in a different world. You know, We're talking about a, an in-season college tournament now in Vegas uh, for a million bucks. So it's about now enticing not just players, but teams to get money for their collectives as well. So is the NIT going to go down that road? Okay, like putting a bow on it for me, as I said, it's fine if, if teams don't want to go. I, I, don't, I don't care. I was just looking at the other side of it, how coaches love to have control in this thing. But I would imagine if the NIT is going to continue, it's going to have to change a little bit and offer a little more to entice teams to show up. And I don't know how you do that when you're not the tournament that makes TV money. So we could be talking about a sinking uh, deck, shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic here to an extent for the NIT.
Welcome back to Gojo and Gold. Mike Gold Jr., Mike Gold Sr., Claudia Bellafato. And we are very excited to welcome in our buddy Nicole Arbach, senior writer over at The Athletic, college football insider for NBC Sports. And you can hear her hosting on Sirius XM Radio. She was part of their Women's Basketball Selection Sunday special this past weekend. Nicole, how you doing this morning, bud? I am doing great. We are finally getting closer and closer to the best couple days of the calendar. Yes. Yeah, the opening weekend of March Madness. Nicole, where does that rank for you in sports holidays between, you know, start of college football season, bowl season, anything else you can put up there? How big is this first weekend for you? Well, I I do think the Pop-Tart Bowl has, you know, kind of changed the calculus on some of this, but I would put it right up there. I mean, it's the best postseason event that we have. And those first four days are just chaos. I mean, you get what, like 14 straight hours of basketball both days. You can sit on your couch. You don't have to go anywhere. And you know that something magical is going to happen. So uh, I, I think it's I think it's number one. And and I can't wait. I'm going to be in Brooklyn. So I'm going to have I'm going to have Yukon and Duke and all of those folks um, in person to watch this weekend. And so it's going to be really, really fun. But I, I also think and I know we're going to get to it in this conversation, but the women's tournament has never been more enticing and, and more exciting and intriguing. So I think we're going to kind of get doubled up. Like, like I think this is going to be an even better first weekend of March Madness because you're going to have incredible games on both sides. Nicole, why do you think that has been the case for women's college basketball versus men's college basketball this year, especially? Well, so I think it's been trending in that direction. I mean, you guys are Notre Dame guys, so you've seen like Hannah Hidalgo's emergence. Like she's a great example of this because this freshman class has been very college ready, right? So you have Juju Watkins at USC, Hannah, you have Madison Booker at Texas. Like they've been among the biggest stars in the sport, not just the biggest freshmen. And then you already have all the stars that everybody knows. You you, you have Caitlin Clark, you have Angel Reese, you have uh, Cameron Brink. So there's some familiarity. And on the men's side, you have so much transience because of the one and done, because of the transfer portal. Um, you just don't have that familiarity. And the coaches who we used to be so familiar with, these, these Hall of Fame icons, a lot of them have left the sport. So it just isn't as as heavy as weighted. Like it's just, it, it's not like you're turning on and seeing Coach K stalking a sideline. Um, so it just feels very different. It feels like you really could go into a sports bar and ask people, Hey, do you, could you name, you know, a couple women's basketball players? They could say, yes. Could you name a couple men's basketball players? They would say no. Like it feels that way this season. Um, and then obviously with the increased viewership, I, I just think more people are exposed to it and then more likely to stick around. So it really does feel like we're headed for another, like kind of leap for the sport of women's basketball. Like we saw last year, just with all the storylines and an undefeated South Carolina, Caitlin Clark's last run. I just think it's going to be really fun. Yeah, listen, I completely agree. The the name recognition and teams, it's, they're the bigger storylines on the women's side than the men's side uh, right now. And, and you're right about this tournament. You can sit down starting at noon on Thursday into the evening for uh, four days. It's, it's one of the best weekends there is in all of sports. Back to the men's side of this, uh, where the women's side can hold chalk a little more. The men's side usually doesn't. So where, where do you see the biggest uh-oh as far as that, the chalk line being erased uh, early in this tournament? Well, it seems like the most popular upset pick already is turning into New Mexico over Clemson. And I think that gets at an overall theme that was coming out of Selection Sunday, which was that these Mountain West teams, yes, the Mountain West got six bids, but they were all under seeded, except maybe maybe San Diego State. That one that one seemed okay. But New Mexico, in at 11, um, the committee chair said that they were a bid thief, so they would not have made the field if they didn't win the tournament. Uh, that feels really low, and that feels like this is the this is this is unfair to Clemson to be to be quite honest. I think it's going to be a really really popular eleven over six upset pick. Um, and you know we've seen fifteens over twos in recent years. We've seen some of those you know those those really big upsets. Obviously a sixteen over one, um, but. The 5-12s, the 11 sixes, those happen all the time. I think another one that people will be really intrigued by, I don't know if they'll pull off the upset, but McNeese State 
and Gonzaga. That's a 5-12 game. That's just a fascinating coach matchup. It's Will Wade, who um, obviously we, we all know a lot about him and his strong ass offers, which are legal now and part of college basketball. So maybe he's the coach of the moment right now. But you've also got Mark Few on the other side. Gonzaga, not quite on that one or two C line that we're used to seeing them. Um, that could be just a really interesting clash. I don't know if they'll pull off the upset, but that's certainly one as well. So I, I would probably live on those 11s and those 12s and, and look at some of them. I, I also think, you know, Kansas, w- we don't know exactly how fully healthy they are. And Samford's a really interesting style matchup for them. I'm not calling that one necessarily as a 13-4 upset, but that's one I would, I would maybe think about. I would I would agree. We were talking about that one a little early in the show. Very enticing. Uh, Big Blue Nation and our friend Claudia Bellafato certainly not pumped about that, considering that she holds a futures ticket on them. But uh, Nicole, we're in that sweet spot right now. This couple of day grace period where you mentioned there are some people with some gripes about this on the men's and the women's side. Who do you think were the biggest snubs that had the most as a case for their team to be left out? Well, I I, I would lean into the the general big East conversation. I think the fact that they only got three teams in and they are the second strongest conference is pretty egregious. I think also just when you look at the way that it shakes out. So when you see like, you know, the first team out and the first four, like the, 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 the couple of those teams, like St. John's wasn't close. And that's where I think you, you have more of a gripe that whatever the committee was valuing wasn't close to what, we think it's supposed to be valuing. Right. And so I think that's, that's where people get really worked up. And I think that the net and the quad system, you know, I, I I don't think like I was tweeting about how coaches and ADs have been frustrated with it and coaches in particular don't, don't think there's a lot of like, you know, kind of clarity on it, but it's not supposed to be like the RPI where you're like, okay, if you have this number, you should get in. It's it's more supposed to be like a supporting metric, but that's not the way that we talk about it. It's not the way we think about it. Um, and so, you know, you do see some really surprising results. I think the seeding overall was really off. I mean, the fact that FAU was an eight and Michigan State was a nine, those were teams that you could have made a case for not being in the field. Like there were just some really big surprises um, in the way that people were maybe not selected, but, but put in to the field and then the teams that were just on the outside looking in. And then you guys know me. I mean, I'm a mid-major fan. I would have loved to see Indiana State and Robbie Avila be part of this field. And I understand they were bid thieves and they were actually pretty close to getting in if there had been, you know, a couple less. But that that system that makes it really hard for an Indiana State to get in as a bubble team is, is also really frustrating to me. I love Rick Patino's St. John's team was 32nd in net, and they didn't make the tournament, obviously. And he said, first off, I think we should all probably never mention the word net again. <laughs> so he's he's done with it uh, as Be well. Tough in basketball. All right, all right Nicole, I, I, I I'm not I'm not asking this, you know, for personal gain. Uh, using a guest to get information on how I'm going to fill out my sheet. I just really would like to know this again. Wink, wink. I'm not going to use this. Who's the first number one seed to lose on the men's side? Oh, okay. That is an interesting question. Um, okay. So I am going to lean into the big East overall. So I am very pro Creighton coming out of the Midwest. Um, but that doesn't mean that I necessarily think Purdue will lose early. I really hope they don't. I really don't want to see them, uh, losing the first weekend and have to deal with another year of these narratives. So I'll say for the first one to go down, let's go North Carolina. I have them losing to Alabama in the third round in my bracket. So that's a team that I'm concerned about. But honestly, you know, Houston, when they're banged up and what we saw in the Big 12 cha- tournament game, uh, that was concerning. But I, I think I'm going to go UNC. I'm going to figure, I'm going to say that Houston's going to figure things out. I'm going to say that Purdue is going to get through the first weekend and be okay until they meet Creighton in the Elite Eight. So let's go North Carolina. I'm sorry, Tar Heel fans. I can say for North Carolina that just came on in uh, sports gambling here, we apologize, but we bring Nicole on for the facts, <laughs> not your feelings. And that's exactly what she gave us here. <laughs> Nicole, can't thank you enough for the time as always, buddy. Happy bracketing. We hope you don't have to light them on fire sooner than the rest of us. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Enjoy the best postseason in sports. Thanks.
Yes, the postseason that could soon, could soon, it's amazing. What she said is absolutely true as far as the entertainment product, and we still cannot help but tinker with it. It is such a sad indictment on who we are as a sport. In Golik, the Chicago Bears are getting quite the makeover for what we assume is going to be Caleb Williams under center if they take him number one overall. You bring in Keenan Allen, DeAndre Swift, you keep more, you keep Komet. Now, all of this would be great, you would think, but some analysts and former players, I shouldn't say some, it's really just RG3, doesn't think this would be a good fit for Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams should pull a Eli Manning and demand that the Chicago Bears do not draft him number one overall. After everything that's happened with just Justin Fields, can Caleb Williams really look at that and say, you know what? This is the organization that has my best interest at heart and they're going to help develop me into the player that I want to become. Don't get me wrong, guys. I thought Ryan Poles was having an amazing offseason up until this trade for Justin Fields because you trade Justin Fields so you can get some players back to help your team out this year. Because Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus, the head coach, Coach for the Chicago Bears they're in a lame duck season they have to win this year or they're going to get fired yes I do think him going back to Washington where he's from he's a DC kid went to Gonzaga College High School okay I think that's the best spot for him but he does have power right now and he should exercise it if he feels like Chicago is not where he should be I had to correct myself and not saying some people think, because I really think it's just RG3 Gojo. Like, who else thinks this wouldn't be a good fit for Caleb Williams? Oh. So I actually, I think it's funny that I don't think Robert is alone on this feeling, but I think he's like a month late. Like, we did this a while back, and now he has brought back the take with incredible gusto in theater, which he often does. RG3, a great showman. But, Dan, I look at this, and this was a lot of the conversation that people were having about Caleb Williams in college when we had these reports of stuff that his dad was saying about was he going to come back to school and this idea that he should leverage this situation. The thing is, is now 
I feel like we've got less reason for that to happen given what the Bears have done this offseason. Like he referenced them not getting parts back for Justin Fields, but in another part of the video, he also talked about how they did Justin Fields, meaning the development process, all the coaching turnover, and those things I will say if we're talking about validity in any of this argument here. I think overall in his post about this, he did a hit on the thing that I've said is a fear this entire time, which is because Matt Eberflus is walking into this season in a lame duck year, you do run the risk of drafting Caleb Williams and then immediately having to reset things with a new coach if you do bring him in. That fear is real. The comparison of organizational health between them and Washington, I don't know if that tilts enough in Washington's favor for me to agree with him at all on this. It absolutely doesn't tilt in Washington's favor. They're, they're changing everything as well outside of Chicago. It just changed, not didn't change their head coach, but bringing in new coaches. I, I, I'm I was stunned to hear that. I could not disagree more with RG three. I, I I I love what the Bears have been doing, and for all the talk, and it was really Caleb's dad that had said it, not Caleb Williams. About uh, do we want to go to Chicago and kind of a mess there. I love what Ryan Poles has been doing. Um, I, I love, you know, Shane Waldron coming in, uh, as the O coordinator, as I said, I didn't, I didn't think the Luke Getze, Justin Fields, um, OC quarterback relationship worked out well, what they're doing. Remember this, how this defense finished up and that's a head coach, Matt Eberflus. He's a defensive guy. This defense was great again in scoring defense, great against the run coming to the end of the season. They trade for Montez Sweat, then they sign him to the long-term deal. They're doing well on defense. They bring in offensive weapons as well. I, I That's why I brought up yesterday. We talked about what C.J. Stroud in Houston did with a lot of first-timers. You're going to get a first-time quarterback here in Chicago with more veteran weapons for him than C.J. Stroud had in Houston. So I, I love how Chicago is setting up their young quarterback. I mean, remember, people, don't, don't, let's not forget about the defense. An excellent defense helps your young quarterback almost as much as weapons on the offensive side of the ball. Chicago has done awesome things to me in this offseason, and Caleb Williams, I think, should feel really good about going to Chicago. But to your point, Mike, that is the one sticking point. If it doesn't go well and they go away from Matt Eberflus, then all of a sudden you have a quarterback who's going in with a second you know, head coach and a second probably offensive coordinator as well. That I can see as a caveat of saying that could be potential trouble there. But overall, I think Caleb Williams is going into a nice building program. Again, you have to see practical application on the field. You can't just get a bunch of pieces and think they're going to mesh together well and it's going to work. But that's all you can do in the offseason is acquire a team and then put it together on the field. And I like what the Bears have been doing and I like the Caleb Williams situation in Chicago yeah we saw practical application at the end of last season I think that's what has people most hopeful is the fact that we did see some improvement actually in the games last year and then you add a couple of these compelling vet pieces on top of, and you walk into the draft like they're going to get more at nine we imagine they're going to be in line for yes. one of those other great receiving options in a draft that's got three of them up top and Roma Dunze Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors so all of that piled together I don't know I figured Robert Griffin III's experience with the Washington franchise would be enough yeah. to maybe dissuade him from this it's a new regime and so maybe it's a you know a tip of the hat to them and what they're building towards there but I, I don't think it's really easy to compare I mean hell part of your roster in Chicago that is drastically improved was a piece that you traded from Washington when they were selling off parts on defense in the middle of this last season right to get to that spot so uh, uh, again I, I think this is much ado about nothing I think so many of the Caleb Williams conversations about trying to exercise power they were things that if there was any of it that did actually come from his camp probably a misstep in creating the perception around this player that he was looking for a lot of that stuff even if the things he was asking for I don't necessarily think bad to ask for it's okay to ask the question but when you have this starting to build up at a time of year where you know dad it, the pre-draft process and we've seen this happen with some prospects already is an exercise in trying to tear people down it's trying to see if teams yeah. can get guys for cheaper get them to fall a little bit all of these games that really toy with the lives of the young men getting ready to go through this process 
And so you're trying to minimize damage in every turn. That's why we've seen so many guys in this process this year between athletes first telling their clients not to take the S2 co- uh, cognitive test at the combine because of how it got used against C.J. Stroud last year. The guys choosing not to get run and get measured. All of these guys saying, I'm not going to give you anything to go on there. You could say that was the misstep in the Caleb Williams process, but it seems like we're so far past it. A lot of good reviews of him post-combine and now sitting here looking at what the Bears have done at this juncture in the offseason. That's why this take surprises me so much because it seems like outside the, the Justin Fields trade is going to be a bump in the road, I think. Yes, they didn't get a ton of capital in return. You would have loved to have seen more. There's a lot of circumstances that explain that. Chicago sat on their hands for a little bit too long. The rest of the quarterback market, blah, 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 blah. Are we really going to let the difference of a couple of rounds of a pick ultimately taint the way we feel about this Bears offseason as they head into drafting a new quarterback at one? I don't think so. I think this is going to be a headline for now, and then it's going to give way to all the hope and resources we've talked about with this Bears team for a while. I, I, I Yeah, I think this Bears team, or at least Caleb Williams, is going to be able to hit the ground running in this situation. Now it, it, it's interesting to me is who they take with the ninth pick now. Because they got Keenan Allen, is it not going to be a wide receiver? Will it be an a left tackle? Will it be an edge rusher? To me, that, that gets a little more interesting. Let me ask you guys this. If you think they're going to get the ground running with Caleb Williams right now at the DraftKings Sportsbook, you can bet on them to make the playoffs. They're actually a favorite to make the playoffs. Not a huge favor, but minus 120 to get in. No, you're getting around <laughs> even money. So is that a bet you would make right now, senior? Listen, we, we see it every year. What do we say? How many years in a row? Four, at least four teams who didn't make the playoffs make the playoffs, and four who made it are out. And the, the surprise last year was Houston. I don't know if I would go that far. That would be an interesting one. It'd be the time to jump on it would be now and before they get off to a hot start and that goes down mm-hmm. a little bit. But I, Mike, I like what they're doing. I, I, boy, that that would make it a tricky one to me. Would I go ahead and and take that chance? You know, and put them in the playoffs while Detroit is is taking over that division. Um, it's not like you know it's they've been doing that for a long time. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of used to Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay running that division, but that's not the case anymore. So that make that's an interesting bet. I wouldn't take it now, but I'm definitely thinking and keeping my eye on that one. I think you've got the NFC South that got a new entrant that's going to make things interesting, but they're probably still a one-team division. The NFC West, yeah. I think, is yep. sneaky going to be one of the best divisions in football this year. Kyler Murray back healthy, what the Rams have done loading up, the 49ers. Anyone trying to hint at their demise doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. So I think I worry about the NFC North being a team, a league that could get three teams in because I think the Packers and I think the Lions are absolutely still playoff teams in that division.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., Claudia Bellafato, and hour number two on Tuesdays now is where you can catch our friend. She's the co-host of Oddball with a very slandered Amin El Hassan right now every Ooh. day but Monday on the DraftKings Network. Charlotte Wilder joining us with what she has described as Stugazi in confidence this morning because of a good night's uh-huh. sleep. Yeah, guys, look, I am, I need, here's my problem. I need a lot of sleep. I'm very bad at going to sleep. So, like, I could stay up <laughs> till, like, 2 a.m., just, like, cranking, and then, I. but I'm like, oh, well, you know, 9 to 10 hours is ideal. So that really cuts into your day. And it's also just not possible if you have, you know, what some people like to call a job. Um, So I went to bed early last night, and I'm just, like, ready to rock. I have, I don't know what my takes are going to be, but like they're, they're coming on strong. So buckle up everybody. Wow. All right, there we go. We admire and love the confidence and Charlotte. That's great. We need your help in that case then, because we have got a lot of things that we need takes about here. Obviously on the NBA front, I have some questions about Kyrie Irving's future that I think are interesting in light of his game winning shot the other night. Anthony mm-hmm. Edwards also just continues to break my brain and do want to give love to the dunk herd around the world last night. But Claudia, before we get to that, we have got housekeeping that I feel like Charlotte can help us out with here. So why don't we get a reset for everybody that wasn't with us in hour one of how they can be a part of our show's various brackets right now, starting with the actual March Madness bracket on the DraftKings Sportsbook. Yes, the actual basketball one is called Beat the Golics. <laughs> it's a contest you can find on DraftKings right now. So basically you're going up against the guys and other DK personalities for $2,000 in bonus bets on the DraftKings app. Of course, it's just whoever has the most points at the end, like any other bracket. Go to DraftKings Network on Twitter, find the link to enter repost it and fill out your bracket and then the one which some people might think is more important is the starch madness bracket we're crowning a champion of fast food in our starch madness bracket on the show and our bracket is out now the full thing and we've been breaking it down we've been talking about the mains but i think it's really important now that charlotte is here having enough sleep to give us maybe some of her hot takes. So, Charlotte, if we're taking a look right now at the uh, the odds, I'm saying, they're not the odds, it's the percentage of what people voted on. We have the double quarter pounder and the Burger King Whopper. Right now, the double quarter pounder is at 58%. Do you agree with this, or is this a little shocking to you? Are you a big BK girl? Okay, uh, so remember when I came in and I was like, I'm so confident I can talk about anything? Um... <laughs> I don't think I've had either of these mm, fine I dishes. Feel that. I get it. I'm with you. Ever? <laughs> ever. Ever? Ever. Ever. Wait. Ever. Okay, all right, Juan, I have a lot of I have a lot of questions now. So, Charlotte Wilder, you have come on this show here. One of our big ticket selling items right now is an entire bracket dedicated to fast food menu items. At Gojo and yeah. Golik on Twitter, people can vote. We are going to have these things battle. 32 fast food items, four regions, main mm-hmm. sides, desserts, and beverages that everyone can weigh in on. Charlotte, what is your relationship with fast food now then overall? Like, is there any fast food restaurant that you like? Did you get drunk in college and go to these restaurants but have foregone it now? What? Where are we at with you here? Yeah, so I am I am really big on fast food for breakfast. Like I have Dunkin, I have Starbucks, like I've, I do those those count, right? Sort of as fast food. Yes. Like yeah, okay. I those I have yeah. their menus just memorize like I could tell you exactly what to get, exactly what not to get. Um I am not as big on fast food other times uh and I say this not with pride. Like this is see I also knew that this was going to happen. I knew I was going to come on really confident and then just immediately get deflated because like, that's the Charlotte Wilder way. Um, But I am not proud of it. Like I'm not proud of it. I think it's sort of, I think it's sort of a um, lame thing to be like, yeah, I don't really eat fast food. I just don't really. I, the, I had Taco Bell once and it was for content on camera. Do you want your baby to come out living Manos? Listen, (laughs) I had, I, the amount of time that I spent in the bathroom after that was like, I was like, oh, this is just not for me. I mean, it is, it is very good good for that, understandably. It's a commitment. Listen, we we all get it. 
with that being said, we will not make you endure too much of this then, Charlotte, because to bring up your no, no, point no, no. about Taco Bell, the two polls that we have added now to the mains, as we have had already the Whopper and the McDouble going at it in that side of things. We've also had the Popeye's chicken sandwich and the Arby's beef and cheddar in the 2-7 matchup. To round this out, we've got the 3-6 matchup between the Chick-fil-A spicy chicken sandwich and the Wendy's Baconator as the 3-6 matchup. The Baconator, which I will say on its best day, is an equal sandwich in quality to the In-N-Out Burger, by and large at the similar price point here. I think In-N-Out Burger's got better PR. And then the 4-5 matchup, the Taco Bell Crunch Wrap Supreme, which I would have, when we were submitting this as a group and we were doing the committee, yeah. I submitted the Crunch Wrap Supreme as the one seed. I think it is one of the best fast food items of all time. It is going up against the five seed in and out double double, which again inspires a lot of passion, especially from people out where I am in the West Coast. And so, Dad, I'm sure you've seen that. I mean, you grew up, we grew up in Arizona for part of the time. You guys have In N Out Burger out there. You see the hype around this thing. I'm just saying it should lose to the Crunch Wrap. So I'm a big Wendy's guy growing up again. I've talked a lot about growing up. McDonald's, Burger King, Arby's, Wendy's. I was a I was a, a triple, a single, and a frosty. That was my order when I was big boned. Uh that that's no Why that was my, my normal go to. Uh, I yeah, it's exactly right. It's exactly not as right. Much bread? Um no, not as much bread. A lot of lot of patty, a lot of square patty. Hey, hey, um chair, but I'm yeah. telling you. After after your your mom and I we would go out to the uh, oh the casino and on the way home there always happened to be a Chick Fil A on the way and I've gotten quite fond of the Chick Fil A spicy chicken sandwich I've gotten very very fond of that and I will say in the other matchup I'm an in and out guy I know Mike you and I disagree a little bit about this I'm an in and out guy I love the double double but I will say. When we were in South Bend, before we came back out here, your mother had a bit of a Taco Bell uh, thing going, so we went there a few times, and I got I started getting that Crunch Wrap Supreme, and and boy, I tell you what, oh. I know what you're talking about with that. That thing is for real. So that one became a little closer than I thought. I think I think I still lean toward In and Out, but the Crunch Wrap Supreme, pretty impressive. So again, three Chick Fil A spicy again, six Wendy's Baconator. Four Crunch Wrap Supreme against number five In and Out Double Double. As Mike mentioned, we already have the double uh, double quarter pounder with a slight lead over the Burger King Whopper, and then we also have the Popeyes Chicken Sandwich with a lead over the Arby's Beef and Cheddar right now. So you guys, gang, you have four matchups to vote on in the mains right now. So make sure you get in there and you vote, and let's see who moves on. Can I salvage my reputation for a second? Uh, before we, it's going to be go hard, but here. go ahead. Okay, so it, the Crime Trap Supreme is that the one that looks like the top of the Mercedes Benz uh, Stadium? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Amazing. <laughs> Loved it. That was one of the things I had. Didn't necessarily agree with me. Tasted incredible. Also, Chick Fil A probably saved my life on the college football road trips I did because I would get into places very late and there was nothing open except the Chick Fil A, and I hadn't eaten all day and. Though I mean, it is it, it's a thing of beauty what they produce there. So um, I guess I've had more fast food than I realize. Um, I'm sorry to America. <clears throat> Thank you. Your apology is accepted, Charlotte. We understand that not everyone's stomachs have been through the wars that mine have, and so these things aren't always going to agree with anyone. But for anyone who spent any amount of time in college under the influence, Taco Bell and that beautiful, beautiful sign have been a beacon in the night. Fourth meal is a lifestyle I subscribe to, and I'm rooting hard. I am openly poisoning the well for the Crunch Wrap Supreme because I think it's that good. We can get to plenty more of that again at Joan Golick on Twitter. We'll keep you guys updated as we go along. We're going to roll out this whole thing. It's going to be it's going to be a whole deal for those of you that enjoy this stuff like me but I, I want to get to some stuff from the NBA that we saw last night well we've got Charlotte here again she hosts a basketball podcast does a great job with that and speaking of salvaging reputations uh, this isn't the conversation I want to have because there's not really a conversation Anthony Edwards the highlights he keeps producing as a human being and as an athlete are incredible because Charlotte I'm sure you saw the dunk heard around the world last night as the Timberwolves were going out there and playing. And I thought the most important part of this was who he dunked on. Anthony Edwards is a stellar athlete. And the man that he dunked on, John Collins, the former longtime mm -hmm. Atlanta Hawk star, who's now cha uh, changed teams there and is out in, was I believe, Utah. Is that where he's at now? 
who got yeah, he was yes. in Utah, who got dunked on, is a man with incredible hops. So much. his nickname was John the Baptist when he was Atlanta, and yeah. now he was on the other side of a baptism so ferocious that it looked like Anthony Edwards actually hurt his hand. So Charlotte, where are you? Like how the poster dunk? Does it bring you a ton of joy? Anthony Edwards is he someone that's ascending up your list of young NBA star players? What do we got here? Yes, beyond belief, what he's done this season and what he's done with uh, the Timberwolves. You know, I, Amin and I were talking about this before the season started about the Wolves, and and uh, there was the the GM survey, and they said that a lot of GMs said that they would rather build a franchise around um, Anthony Edwards than I I forget who the other. I should have. This is what. See, you know, I'm was it like Jason I am Tatum? ready. Yeah, maybe. But, I thought like, it was but it wasn't. It was Tatum, but it wasn't like all of them said that. It was like only a few said that, but enough people said it that he got on the he got on the top five. Um, and in the in the months since then, I have been we have been humbled by by what this young man has done. I think that dunk over John Collins, um, the way Collins recoiled to me was particularly like there was a. <laughs> I'm not dapping. Just it so looked like he was knows. dabbing. Was it? Was it? Yeah, sort of. But like he, he, his face. There was horror on his face. I think Mike Conley huh. um, said after the game, he was like, "I think that's the best dunk that I've ever seen in my life." And Edward said it gave me chills to dunk over somebody like that. So something that I also think is really cool is when guys admit that something was a big moment. Um, we saw this. Jalen Brunson on Saturday night um, against Keon Ellis. He, you know, faked him out. And Keon Ellis had this look on his face. I don't know if you guys saw that of just like sheer disbelief. His, the, like if you zoom into his face, he's literally going like, like just eyes wide. Can't believe what happened. And and I'm always impressed by how players don't betray more of that. Like after if I if I dunked on someone or if I did something unbelievably cool in an NBA game, I would be grinning. I would be like I would have absolutely no cool about it. But these guys are just like they're like. Yep, on to the next one. You know, very professional. It's what you have to do. Betray nothing. Um, so when there are moments like that where they say, yeah, yeah. that was pretty cool, um, I think that's really fun. I, I completely agree. Dislocated his finger on that, on, on the, the guy's face, who he was dunking on, popped it back in, went in the locker room, popped it back in, kept on playing. So you got to love that as well. The, the interesting thing to me, Charlotte, or the more mm -hmm. impressive thing is remember when Philly lost Joel Embiid and they were at one point, I think they as high as three. Now they're sitting in the sixth slot. They've fallen. So you've lost Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert has not been in the line. You know, he's been in and out and this mm -hmm. team has hung around. I mean, there, yeah. you, you wondered if there was going to be a fall off. They're sitting there. They Oklahoma city and Denver are battling for that number one spot. So they've kind of stayed right there. I still think there's about 15 games to go, I think, that Denver will end up the number one seed. But that probably more impressive to me than anything, Charlotte, is the fact that they're hanging right there in the number one slot without two of their biggest stars and, and literally biggest stars. Yeah, totally. Senior, I completely agree. And I, and I think that this is a testament to what individuals can do for a team and a team environment. Um, you know, People who've listened to this or listened to me know that I'm a big, you know, environment determines a lot guy. Um, and I think that when you have someone performing at this high level that Anthony Edwards is um, and really going out there every night and putting up highlight reels like this, it it can't help but galvanize a team. Um, and a lot of times that with, with in the NBA where you have such parity overall, like, yes, Maybe not for the Wizards, maybe not for the Pistons, but like you, you have such talented players that a lot of times the mindset and what's happening around you can influence what's going on on the floor. Charlotte, that is a perfect segue in what I want to talk about with Kyrie Irving. And Claudia, mm -hmm. what we've seen from the Mavs, who have certainly turned it around in this last stretch, I think goes a long way in that, as they've now won five of their last six and appear to be in good position in no small part because of Kyrie Irving's effort.
Well, it's funny, as Charlotte was talking about Anthony Edwards and what he's been able to do on a team that has the number one defense. I think that is the difference between them and Luka and Dallas. But lately, they're finding momentum at the right time, Gojo, as you just talked about it. They've won five of their last six, so inching their way up the Western Conference standing. Still in seventh, though, half a game back of the Kings. They do play tonight, eight and a half road favorite, which speaks a lot to what the books are thinking of them right now against the Spurs. But everybody in the world is still talking about Kyrie. Kyrie's southpaw hook shot against the Nuggets from Sunday. Something we've been all waiting to see. All we do is talk about Luka Luca and why he deserves MVP because he's not getting help. But if Kyrie comes out and starts doing more of this, it's like a little deja vu. This is what we've been waiting to see, Charlotte, isn't it? Totally. I mean, that was a game winner. Like, that did it. That, that was a buzzer beater left handed hook shot. Like, what? That over, over uh, Jokic? Like, I, I mean, I just think that they, that that's what makes Kyrie fun to watch when he plays. But when he does things like that, that are just sort of physics bending, he's he's not it, you're like that. That shouldn't be possible. Um, and you're right, Claudia, giving Luca the help that, you know, people have been saying maybe Luca doesn't like that because he's like, well, I was supposed to get MVP <laughs> for doing this all on my own. But no, just kidding. I think he probably likes it. But. You know, it, it's fun to see that, and and we haven't as much, and I wonder if down the stretch this is something that we're going to start seeing more from Kyrie. But, Dad, but you're going to say something? What, what is this? Yeah, I was going to say, but, but what does this do? I mean, as a team, they're still sitting in the seven slot, tied with, with Phoenix seven and eight. Nobody is thinking they're all of a sudden going to be one of the top teams, even though what an incredible play by Kyrie. Luka could be the MVP. But this team is still a play-in team. And now they have a chance, obviously, you know, with Sacramento, they can catch them. But I'm wondering, cool, looked great, but the whole idea here is to win a championship. So as they go on, Charlotte, I mean, is this a team that could continue to build? We keep talking about, is Luka going to end up somewhere else? I don't think he is. But this is still a possible play-in team. Well, I think that's my point, though, in all this, Dad, and why I was interested in this conversation about Kyrie Irving, because they're not going to win a championship this year. We know they're too bad on defense. This is a team that is absolutely deficient on that side of the floor. I'm not worried about that as much as I am, hey, have we salvaged Kyrie Irving now? Because for a while, it felt like this was a guy that was lost. The Boston tenure was so bad. The Brooklyn Nets tenure was even worse. It crashed and burned in no small part because of who we perceived Kyrie to be off the court and who he had shown himself to be. And ever since he got down to Dallas, it's been real quiet on that front. And and I saw Michelle Beadle yesterday on Sirius X or uh, Mad Dog Sports Radio talking about there was a joy with Kyrie Irving, a joy with his teammates right now that exists. And Charlotte, for a guy that was chasing the Supermax that didn't get it, that wound up here on a three-year deal and is still getting paid well but has a player option after next season, I do wonder if, to Dad's point about the long-term health, have they found someone now who, as he has maybe simplified the equation in the off-the-court stuff for him, gotten back to the player that we all love watching on the court, if this can be a more long-term solution. He's only 31 years old to, hey, let's get Luka a running mate and then start to flesh out this roster around the two of them because that's what Dallas has been searching for, someone to pair with the guy that's unquestionably one of the best players in the NBA, and they've got Kyrie, who's always been one of the best number twos that basketball's ever seen. Totally, totally. And, and I think something, what you said there, Mike, Kyrie's 31. I think that there's a lot of maturing that has happened here. I think, you, as you said, he's simplified what he's doing off the court. I think he's probably also realized that the juice isn't worth the squeeze when it comes to all of that stuff. Um, I actually, I talked to someone last year who had talked to Kyrie um, about, you know, the off court stuff. And, and, and I think he, he felt that, um, Kyrie seemed more willing to listen than I think people in the media might have been saying, which was interesting to me because it sort of checks out with what has gone on in in Dallas right now, where you see he's really focused on the game and and there was that joy. We saw that joy. And I'm not, you know, I'm not excusing any of the off-court stuff that he did by any means. Um, but I do think that in we are a society and the way we talk about things, we are very uh, bad at saying, hey, look, someone made progress. And I think a lot of times doing less is progress. And he's doing less off the court. He's doing more on it. And um, 
it's just been it's been fun to watch. And if he can sustain that, Mike, then absolutely, I think he's going to keep being one of the best number twos. And I think it does change the way we talk about what is Luca going to do going forward. Yeah, I think that becomes the biggest headline because that's been Dallas's charge and worry for a long time now is trying to find someone sort of the James Harden problem from Houston years ago where they did put a bunch of pieces next. They didn't work. And as we've talked about this, I cannot imagine how jealous Jets fans are seeing what's become here and hoping they can get that for their quarterback. Golik reigning NL Cy Young winner Blake Snell has finally found a new home, but interestingly enough, it's within his own division, going from the Padres to the Giants, two years, $62 million, and I'm this shocked because I don't know why it took so long. A guy sitting there who led the league in ERA, 225, 234 strikeouts. I mean, he was far and away the best guy on the free agent market, but finally, he is picked up, unfortunately not by the Red Sox. It is by the Giants, so great news for them. And as we're looking at the Cy Young market, Spencer Strider, the Braves ace, is the favorite. You're seeing here plus 150 for the strikeout market. You're getting a much better payout for Cy Young, but let's talk about why strikeouts is a better number. Game to game, you're going to be chasing 9.5 Ks per game. Some games, it's going to be juiced to the over. We don't want to do that. So instead, we're going to go here plus 150. 281 strikeouts he had last season. That was 44 more than Kevin Gosman, who had the second most. So just think about the gap between him and everybody else. K rate in the top 1% of all pitchers. Chase rate top five. ERA wasn't necessarily there. Expected ERA looked good, which means positive regression is coming, but you want that ERA for Cy Young, which is why we're going to the strikeout market for Spencer Strider, guys. I think baseball has assembled the best collection of stats of any of the four major sports, bar oh. none. When you get 
trace rate or chase rate, exit velocity, oh, all of these delightful God. numbers that happen around the plate. It is an absolute joy. So that is incredible information from Claudia, who will be doing more of that around here. She can educate you guys on the vast intricacies of sports gambling far better than Dad and I are going to right now. So follow her to freedom. Follow us to dumb food takes here upon this rock. We are going to build this church. Charlotte, I can see you who walked in here with all this confidence today and have been leaking it ever since now looking with googly-eyed admiration of what Claudia just did. Listen, I would watch you up there, Claudia, and you were saying those numbers, and I was like, oh my God, that is a lot of numbers Guys. and a lot of really <laughs> smart things about those numbers. Like, that blew my mind. Keep doing that. And, uh, you know, God. That, that's not even, oh man, I, I was working for MLB Network last year, and that's great because we're all baseball nerds. And so we were just diving into the. There, there, there's a stat with bacon, the word bacon in it, which you guys would all appreciate. Like, baseball is so fun. <laughs> yeah, and it actually, like, tells what? you about the sport. Of, like, it, it's really complicated, and MOBA and WRC Plus dives deeper, and ERA is actually a stat you really shouldn't look at because it doesn't tell you everything. So expected mm -hmm. ERA, that's the reason I mentioned it, because it tells you a lot more. FIP, field independent pitching, there, there's a lot of things we could get into. But the reason I'm mad is because Blake Snell's so damn good, and the Red Sox really needed somebody to help the rotation and they didn't get it the only guy they picked up's already hurt so anyways yeah this is therapy I, listen, for claudia I've listened, <laughs> seriously I, I, i've listened to everything you said i hope there's not a test on all the numbers and things that you threw out <laughs> no. there like snell a night night you're right why did it take so long one oh. of what seven pitchers who went to saw young in both leagues How, but but i have to go back to what you said how is bacon involved <laughs> I don't, really, I don't really it. use the stat a ton, but I, if you go on Baseball Savant, it, it's part of the, the stat chart, so we don't have to get into it. It's complicated. There you go. Even <laughs> Baseball Savants know and understand that bacon is an important part of any balanced diet and certainly a part of any wow. important baseball team that you're putting together. So the proof is in the pudding, or in this case, the bacon. And Claudia has brought plenty of it home for us, and we greatly appreciate it here. I am going to segue into the dumbest thing that we could talk about as Claudia has talked about all these things that we have in place to make sure that we have a way to measure some of the best athletes on earth doing their thing. These are people that have given their lives to this craft in an effort to do things like hit a baseball incredibly well. In my dad and I's case, go out there and block and tackle really well. In the NBA case that we saw last night, Anthony Edwards dunked so hard, and I'm surprised this doesn't happen more often, that it actually dislocated his own finger. And then we get this headline, Charlotte, that DeAndre Ayton, who just did a podcast interview talking about some of his recent success and talked about reasons why early in the season he seemed to struggle. And one of the things that he brought up was about his sleeping. DeAndre Ayton said that sleeping on an air mattress earlier in the season may have contributed to some of his struggles. He said, my body wasn't just my body. People forget the humane difference of me adjusting to everything. That included something as routine as getting proper sleep, just being comfortable and waking up. I didn't have a bed for quite some time. I was on an air mattress just trying to figure this out. Now, he's had a hell of a year. He missed that game because of an ice storm. He's in a new location in Portland. He was very warm and in Arizona before. I understand all these things, but Charlotte, I am going to need someone to explain to me like I'm five. And he mentioned the adjustment there. I don't understand why a millionaire athlete had a mat had a mattress that was anything other than the comfiest thing that he could buy here. And I, I, I'm going to need more than he gave me in order to not judge him for being this cavalier with such an important part of his night routine, one that you took very seriously last night. This is insane to me. Yeah, I don't think there's a piece of furniture more uh, integral, integral? God, I really came in here hot, and now I'm just questioning everything that comes out of my mouth. <laughs> I don't think there is a more important piece of furniture than a bed for an athlete. Like, what else do you need? Literally, what else do you, like, sleep, like, you need to sleep, and you need to sleep well, and that is often tied to your mattress. And, Mike, the only the only thing that I can say, not in, not in Aiton's defense, because this is indefensible, but and I said this on Onball yesterday. Do you ever have those um, those tasks that are just so daunting? Like you can't like it's so simple, and it would take a very small amount of time or or effort to do. Like sometimes the dishwasher, oh, buddy. I got a whole load of laundry in the dryer mm -hmm. right now that I've put off folding for a day. I feel yes. you. 
Yes, exactly. Like the dishwasher, you look at it and it's like my my mom had a great a great thing about the dishwasher. She's like, I hate unloading the dishwasher, but I timed myself and it takes under two minutes. And if I can't just like give two minutes of my life to this task I don't like, which is now what I use to help myself unload the dishwasher. But as someone who I am bad at stuff like that, like like logistics really can be daunting to me. I can imagine DeAndre facing something like that or like maybe the bed frame was on back order or he couldn't get, you know, whatever it was. But but DeAndre, my dude, like this is what the millions of dollars are for. This is when you call someone and you say, I'll give you a bunch of money. If you procure me, not even a bed frame, just get me a really nice mattress and I'll put that on the floor with a box spring. Like it, that that's what, you know, you can throw money at some problems, especially when you have a lot of it. And I think this was a case where it would have been very simple to do that. You know, they, they say money can't buy you happiness, but money can damn well buy you a good night's sleep. <laughs> I mean, this man makes $32 million a year. Not that you need to make $32 million a year, though I'm sure any one of us would enjoy that. You don't have to make $32 mil a year to get a good night's sleep. I, I don't understand this one, but I, I understand what we're all talking about, simple tasks that you just leave and don't do, and then they build up on you. But if you are actually saying that your sleep is affecting your play in the new area that, that you're in, but this part of it is affecting your play. Charlotte, you're right. One phone call. Hey, get me a bed. I have money. Get me a bed. I'll give you this money. You give me a bed that has a mattress on it. As easy as you said, a mattress on the floor. So what? At least a mattress. I I, I don't understand this one. To, I, I would completely understand because I did it when I was single and I first went to the Oilers. And I tried to cook for myself and how my kitchen just overflowed with pans that I wouldn't wash and all that. I get it. But you know what? I damn well made sure I got a good night's sleep. You know, I mean, there, there are things that on a priority list that should be up there. And I, I don't get this one. Most of the primal human functions exist for a reason. I always tell people like drinking water, the simplest solution. Water made the Grand Canyon. If you think it can't improve your bodily functions, you're insane. DeAndre Ayton... In the first three months of the season, averaged 12.7 points and 10 and a half rebounds for the first three months of the year. Since the All-Star break, he's averaged 25.1 points per game. Only Nikola Jokic among centers has averaged more. He scored 30 points three times and grabbed more than 15 rebounds three times. If you don't think sleep and proper sleep can improve your life, it literally doubled his output as an NBA basketball player. And so if you're sitting there like Charlotte, and I'm the same way, Charlotte, chasing the night, a little bit of reverse bedtime syndrome where you want to get that last bit of your day, it has changed DeAndre Ayton into like an all-star caliber player after the break I, I hope he gets a mattress deal out of this this needs to be the final part of all of this is DeAndre Ayton has to have the best mattress deal in all of Portland coming tomorrow
Nacho and Golik. The Vikings are moving on up in the draft. On Friday, the Vikings made a trade with the Texans, acquiring Houston's 23rd overall pick for their 42nd and 188th selections. The additional first rounder puts Minnesota in position to move up even further in the draft, with many suspecting they will target a quarterback. Take a look at all that draft capital for the Vikings. Two in the first, fourth, and fifth round. One in the sixth and two in the seventh. Vikings GM Kwesi Adolfo Mensa was asked about the team's draft strategy yesterday in a radio appearance, and he said, at the moment, I would say there's a preferred scenario, but evaluation is ongoing. Gojo, what do we think is that preferred scenario? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems to be a, a preferred scenario, I'd imagine, and we'd all imagine involving a quarterback, Dad. Like, that was the thing that jumped off the page here. It's worth noting that I believe the Texans initiated this trade or were the one that came to the table on them. The Texans did spend two first-round draft picks last year, so there's financial implications as to why they may have gone down this road. But regardless, it nets the Vikings now an incredible amount of capital in a draft that's got kind of an interesting setup up top where we've talked about three quarterbacks coming off the board for so long. J.J. McCarthy out of Michigan's been waiting in the wings, and so there's a question about who they'd go up for, Dad, but I think all of us, myself included, would be stunned now if Minnesota's not extremely active early in the draft in trying to climb and see which of these guys they can pull from this group of quarterbacks. Yeah, th this is this is a no-brainer. They, they've, they've acquired assets to move up to do it. They're not going in to the season as, with Sam Darnold as their starter. You know, Sam got that one-year $10 million deal, backed up uh, Brock Purdy in San Francisco last year, trying to continue to resurrect his career after being a high first-round pick and it not working out with the Jets. So as he tries to come back, I don't think it's going to be Minnesota saying, okay, we now signed you and here's your chance. You're the starter. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any doubt that they are going to make a move to get a quarterback. As we've said all along, there's going to be five quarterbacks taken in the first round, and we'll see how many of these pan out. But now Minnesota is in a position uh, to go ahead and move up to where they think they need to to get the quarterback that they want. And as I've always said, it comes down to grades. We talked about the five quarterbacks that could be involved in the first round. What's your grade on all of them? Some are unreachable. You know, you're not going to get up. Chicago is going to take a Caleb Williams. You're not getting up that high uh, to do something like that. But where is your comfort level on what quarterback you're going to take, what grade you have for that quarterback, and what you have to give up to get that quarterback? Because basically, Charlotte, the – Musical chairs is kind of done, right, with the quarterbacks, whether they're starting quarterbacks, whether they're backup quarterbacks, whether they're first-round busts that have moved on. Uh, we have a lot of chairs that are already filled and no one else for really Minnesota to go get to say you're going to be our starter. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like all of these draft picks, all you, you build that kind of capital to be able to make the kind of moves that the Vikings now need to make, seeing as Kirk Cousins is uh, no longer a man up north with them. Um, that... I love when teams have that much draft capital. I love when they just have so many picks. Cause like that to me, I feel like if I were the GM of a team and I saw that I only had one pick for each round, I'd be like, I don't know. That feels like not enough guys. I'd be like, I just feel like if my team was not great, we need more guys than that. And so I love that they've just got multiple picks in multiple rounds. I know that they'll probably end up trading those to, um, get where they need to go in terms of the pecking order. But man, it is so fun to see all of those amassed. It's like, like a cartoon character being like, ha ha ha, look at all my draft picks. Well, and I think we've arrived at a place now where so much of the conversation, and this is largely driven by the Patriots franchise for years of trading back, amass more picks, more tickets to mm -hmm. the lottery for a chance to hit on some of these players because we know the hit rate is so dubious. And I think this is the double-edged sword for the Minnesota Vikings is, what we're talking about here, the kind of offer that could bring you up in range for a quarterback here where people are wondering, hey, do you have to get up here and get in front of the New York Giants at six? We're sort of a wild card in the midst of this based on the reporting we've heard around Daniel Jones's future. We know Arizona set at quarterback. New England at three could certainly take a quarterback. The Los Angeles Chargers aren't going to be in that game. And so where they're going to have to go in to get who is a big question because if you're jumping up past the Giants at six, 
you're probably talking J.J. McCarthy range, the rate that we expect quarterbacks to come off the board here, and that becomes a little bit of the worry for me because swinging for a guy like that not too long in the distant past when we saw what happened with Trey Lance, who was a similar bet on traits and upside that the 49ers had to trade a King's Ransom to go up and get. And when we've got in the background, I saw this note from Dante Koplowitz Fleming over at the NFL. He is their editorial researcher, and this per NFL research, from 2021 to 2022, there were 19 quarterbacks selected in the NFL draft. Two of those 19 are expected to start in week one, being Trevor Lawrence, the first overall pick from 2021, and Brock Purdy, the last pick from 2022. So Charlotte, this is the thing waiting on the other side, potentially, when you do take these kind of massive swings for a guy that, if you're only in range for the fourth best quarterback in the draft, presents a massive risk. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because I'm from New England and that's been ingrained in my head for too long, but I think you're better off taking... Um, the position players you need a lot of the time than taking a big swing. Obviously, that's not always true. And hindsight is twenty twenty. Like if you were if you were faced with an amazing quarterback prospect, like absolutely, why wouldn't you do that? Um, but then it's on you to develop them. That is a huge piece of this. It is not. It is not on these young quarterbacks who are in their early twenties to be their own development. Right. Like you need an apparatus. If you're going to take a young guy, you need to know that your organization can handle developing that person. Also, Mike, the way that you were talking about the Giants, when they have Drew Locke, who recently said, and I quote, (laughs) there is no ceiling for this team. I mean, I don't know what more you could want between him and Danny Dimes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) About the no ceiling thing. I live with a Giants fan. There's like there's like a lot going on. (laughs) So the, a question I would ask you, Mike, is you look at Minnesota and what they did. They needed help on the defense. They went out and got a couple of edge guys in Grenard and Van Ginkle. Um, they they ran out of the running back position, let it go with Dalvin Cook and put it all on Mattson. They let him go now as well. They did bring in, obviously, Aaron Jones in the musical chairs of, of running backs as uh, – Josh Jacobs goes to Green Bay and Aaron Jones goes to Minnesota. This is a team I wonder, Mike, you know, we talked about when New England was kind of rebuilding a bit that they were at the bottom of the division. Am I? Are you putting Minnesota behind Chicago? Minnesota's got – got. To, and so what are they doing at quarterback? Are they going to have a young quarterback too just like Chicago's going to have with Sam Darnold kind of there maybe to start it out or maybe not? I would just give it to the young guy and let him go. I, I Almost like I did with New England, I may be putting Minnesota at the bottom of this division starting out the season. Yeah, to me, it's heavily dependent on what they do at quarterback. I saw some people wondering would they trade up with a team like New England – in position to potentially have a longer timeline to build on, would you trade up there and try and see, hey, does Washington do the Jaden Daniels thing? Can you go get a Drake May instead? That I would look at and be comfortable with based on the way that I view these prospects. If you're jumping up to five and taking J.J. McCarthy, then yeah, I'm absolutely putting you behind Chicago because I think right now coming into the league, I understand the J.J. McCarthy tools. That kind of price tag for a player that needs that much development at this level seems a little bit risky and a little bit too rich for my taste, but I get it. This is what I said when you went up for there for Trey Lance and the 49ers did it years ago is if you're going to take a swing, you do it for incredible talent. So I can understand the thought process there. I think for me, I'm just having a hard time because we got burned so badly on that. And because of what we saw transpire recently, some of that can seeps in. So it, it, it's I understand the decision making. I supported it then. And so in theory, I should support it now. But I think part of me is looking and learning and going, all right, we've really got to put a premium on guys that might be a little bit more ready to come in and do this right now. And I think Caleb Williams is absolutely in a better position to come in and help with all the weapons around there in yep. Chicago with the way that that's built and do that right now versus the Minnesota Vikings. I'm with you on that, Dad. So I, I think they, I don't know, that would probably say, I would probably say that if we're looking for the teams that will define the draft, we certainly always know it's going to be the Bears walking in with the kind of capital they have with two top 10 picks. Right. I think New England has a chance to be that team. And I think we talked about the Giants being sneaky in that fold. But with the addition of this second pick and knowing the uh, uh, Vikings have a need at this position, now all of a sudden they're creeping into that where they're one of the handful of teams that has become the most interesting for this upcoming draft because of what they have the potential to make happen. Shut up.
All right, guys, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, and the third. Three quick stories to send you into the day. Make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out here live Monday through Friday, 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network. Check out Oddball with Charlotte Wilder and Amin El Hassan on the DraftKings Network as well, every day but Monday. And if you miss any of the great show or our guests, shout out to Nicole Arbach, senior writer over at The Athletic, came and talked some college hoops with us here. And, of course, Charlotte Wilder for hanging out with us in hour number two. If you miss any of that, check it out wherever you get your podcasts or right here on YouTube as soon as we get done. An update at Gojo and Golik on Twitter is where you can vote in our Starch Madness bracket. Our quest, a 32-team bracket for the best fast food item in the world. Today we have the main menu items voting. We've got main menu sides, desserts, and drinks. The mains are up today. And right now, you have until tomorrow morning, so 8 o'clock Eastern tomorrow to continue voting on this. We've got the one seed double quarter pounder with a 57% vote lead over the eighth seed Burger King Whopper. We've got the Popeye's Chicken Sandwich 2 seed with a 61.5% lead over the seven seed Arby's Beef and Cheddar, which hurts my whole heart. Uh, the three seed uh, Chick-fil-A Chicken Sandwich with a 56% lead over the Wendy's Baconator. And last but not least, the four seed Taco Bell Crunch Wrap Supreme with a 56.1% lead over the In-N-Out Double Double sitting there at the five seed. So go out and vote there. Also head over to at DK Network on Twitter to get involved in our March Madness pool on the DraftKings Sports because, well, you got a lot of homework today. I hate giving you homework, but it's yeah. for a good cause. You win that DK pool. You win $2,000 in bonus bets. You win the March Madness bracket and help us with starch, bracket, starch madness, and you win the undying love and support of everyone here on the show. So all that being said, Let's get to this, that, and third. Speaking of March Madness, very funny thing happened the other day. You can't say the committees don't have a sense of humor. Trev Alberts, the now former Nebraska athletic director who got hired away by Texas A&M, had a bit of a funny moment happen the other day because in both the men's and the women's brackets, we have Nebraska and Texas A&M squaring off, and Ter Trev Alberts had the audacity to tweet about it. Charlotte, in this day and age, someone courting that kind of chaos online, I almost have to tip my cap to because I'm not as brave as that man was willingly lighting his mentions on fire. This is either someone who is extremely good at social media and knows exactly what he's doing or has literally never tweeted before because it could be that that baby babe in the woods like, "Hey, sure, this is funny and you've never you've never been through the the hellfires of Twitter before." Sorry, X, whatever. Uh yeah, I loved it. I loved it. I respected it and I hope he never stops. <laughs> yeah, uh, listen. I'm one of those when in doubt, don't hit send. Uh, but that that's just me. I'm I'm very, I, I, I'm not great on this whole whole Twitter social media thing. So when in doubt, I'm not putting anything out there that I'm going to get ripped on. I've been burned too many times of tweeting something and either having my wife, Mike, Jake, or Sydney immediately text me and say, "Take that down because it's stupid," and me doing it. So when in doubt. Uh, I do nothing, and maybe maybe Trev is more secure in himself and not caring about what uh, is going to go on in his mentions. But it is pretty ironic, and, and and the committees had to be snickering as they were doing this, knowing full well what the meaning was. He knew what he, he also was doing. just he might not have anyone looking out for him. Is all I'm saying. Someone might should have texted him and be like, "Hey, bud." That is true. You got to have those friends. You got to have a group chat or a friend that you send stuff by before you throw it out there on the timeline. That's day one stuff. Protect yourself from the horrors of the internet. Uh, let's get to that, Claudia. We got podcasts dropping right now and a little bit of would you rather between two very new podcasts with two very different <laughs> goals and angles, I'd imagine. Yeah, you guys have to answer. Okay, so which podcast would you rather listen to? We have Lamar Odom <laughs> and Caitlyn Jenner. It's called Keeping Up With The Sports. That's cute. Uh, boxing legend Sugar Ray Leonard is going to be the first that they interview. A and they put a teaser out on, I think I was listening to an Apple podcast, and they get into sports, of course, but Lamar Odom's talking about his overdose, and then Caitlyn Jenner uh, compares his overdose to uh, her nose job. It's very confusing, but anyways, that's one. And then LeBron and J.J. Redick... This is mind the game strictly. They were very specific. It's strictly pure basketball talk. No opinion here. It's set to debut on Tuesday, which is very soon. It's going to be weekly, 45 minutes to an hour. So you have LeBron and J.J. Redick and Lamar Odom and Caitlyn Jenner. Going to be a very different in the sports world, but different, Gojo. 
I, I'm excited for the clips that eventually come from the Lamar Odom, Caitlyn Jenner one because I know they'll be deeply unhinged. Yeah. I am very excited for the actual basketball portion of this other one in Charlotte. I think it's interesting because it serves a couple masters. LeBron's a guy who always has seemed to have a desire to be in the content space. He's had a whole bunch of stuff uninterrupted that's certainly qualified as that, the shop and others. But this also comes about a month after J.J. Redick went on first take, the premier take show of our time, and kind of criticized the entire model and asked about people that wanted more of the specific X's and O's of basketball and now a month later is debuting a show that does that with arguably the greatest basketball mind or one of the greatest basketball minds of all time in LeBron James. So I'm fascinated for this coming at that juncture because of that background of the criticism JJ just offered. Totally. I think it's also a really, really smart move on LeBron's part because, I mean, he's such a basketball genius and JJ is so good at podcasts and he is so good at broadcasting. He will get out of LeBron what, um, you know, he's, they're both going to make each other better, I think. And that's the, that's the key. I think that they've set themselves up for success. I think podcasting is something that a lot of people think they can do. And I think having done it for long enough to both success and not success, I can see where, um, the pitfalls might be. So I'm really excited for this. Shout out Jason Gallagher, uh, who is directing this. Uh, yes. That is another reason that this show will succeed. So I can't wait. Uh, listen, it's going to be great. I, I I look forward to J.J. Redick is a star. Completely agree. I look forward to it. But it doesn't even compare with what I, I'm, I'm listening to Caitlyn Jenner and Lamar Odom. Listen, <laughs> I, I was a rag magazine guy all the time. Weird headlines, weird stuff. I'd read it and say, boy, oh boy, are these people messed up and it ain't me. I can't wait to listen to the what is going to come out of their mouths about their lives. So to me, that one is going to be way more interesting and make me feel way better about myself <laughs> after hearing some of the stuff that they're going to talk about. JJ and LeBron might make me feel really bad about my podcasting abilities. <laughs> I, I just need Lamar and Lamar Odom and uh, and Caitlyn Jenner to have Stephen A. Smith on so we can reenact the very <laughs> famous Stephen A. Smith quote, Lamar Odom, who was on crack that lives rent free in my head, along with Max yeah. Kellerman's stunned <laughs> disbelief face in the background of that shot. Guys, let's get to the third, uh, Claudia, as all of the world of sports is trying to upgrade facilities. The NFL is constantly in an arm race to make their fan experience more like being at home. And the Arizona Cardinals may have stepped up to become the final boss of this. Yeah, you can literally be at home, but be at the game to watch the Cardinals lose. Rich people doing rich people <laughs> things. Um, they're casitas, they're called. Uh, they're coming to State Farm Stadium this season. The NFL equivalent to a beachfront property. That That's a quote. That's what it's being referred to as. Custom-built field-level casitas located behind the south end zone. 20 people can watch the game from different locations, including the front yard or rooftop deck. All-inclusive food and beverages valet parking private entrance I, this is a little ridiculous i get it like arizona is a cool place to go but should we not focus on the team maybe a little bit more before we start doing things like this charlotte no, what's, what's your focus take on, on the this? team <laughs> no is... not focus on the team they're focused on the money listen this is like over at sofi that has those suites at ground level you can't see the game what they're doing now is making you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for the worst seats in a stadium. But people are going to do it because it looks cool. And this looks unbelievably cool, but you'll have horrible seats for a game. But that's what a big board is for, to go ahead and watch it there because you sure as hell aren't going to see a lot from where you're sitting. But boy, you're going to be sitting in the lap of luxury. The hassle of getting to an NFL game is so obnoxious that, like, mm -hmm. why would you do it if you're not going to be in for the feel of it? And you know why? Because it has that fancy marble atrium. Anything in a stadium that has a fancy marble atrium and a special elevator all to itself, rich people flock to it. It could be the crappiest yep. setting, worst seats. As long as there is a marble entrance and an <laughs> elevator, people will pay. <laughs> You're right. I'm just pumped because we're definitely going to get a rich person hit in the face with a football at some point. Like it's too close. I understand they've got the nets and stuff there, but eventually it's going to be compromised. There's too many openings here and there's distractions. This is what we see all the time. Major league baseball ran into, especially before the pitch clock is you're looking down too right. much. You've got too much time in between plays and Lord knows football has that. That is my worry. That is my hope. My hope is that you'll also download, subscribe, rate, review our show, leave it a five-star rating and check us out here. Thanks so much. We'll talk to y'all tomorrow. Tomorrow.